My name is Inigo Montoya. You kill my functor. Prepare to die. Welcome to a Programming Languages virtual meetup pre-recording. My name is Connor Hookstra, and in today's video, we're going to be covering Chapter 6 of Category Theory for Programmers by Bartosz Maluski, entitled Simple Algebraic Data Types. Before we take a look at the table of contents, as we did in last chapter's video, we're going to take a look at this diagram from Category Theory as a tool of thought. Once again, I'll link it in the description. And we're just covering what each of these chapters uh, covers from this diagram. So in chapter three, we covered monoid. In chapter four, we covered Kleisley category and writer. In chapter five, last week's video, we covered product sum, terminal object, initial object, and duality. And in chapter six, we're going to be covering algebraic data types. So taking a look at the table of contents, there are four subsections excluding the challenges section product types, records, some types, and algebra of types. So let's hop into product types. The chapter starts off by saying the canonical implementation of a product of two types in a programming language is a pair. In Haskell, a pair is a primitive type constructor, and in C++, it's a relatively complex template defined in the standard library. So note the key thing here is that a product of two types is a pair. And specifically in C++, we use a class or you could use a struct to implement uh, a pair type. So implicitly here, it's referring to uh, classes and structs from a lot of the sort of imperative programming languages that we all know. So whenever you're using a class or using a struct in which you're adding, you know, strings, integers, uh, primitive types or other user defined types to that class, and they are sort of all combined together. So it's, you can think of it as logical ands in between those types. Um, that is a product type. So later on in this subsection, it goes on to remark that these observations, the observations having to do with the isomorphism uh, between uh, different types of pairs, can be formalized by saying that set, the category of sets, is a monoidal category. It's a category that's also a monoid in the sense that you can multiply objects. Here, take their Cartesian product. I'll talk more about monoidal categories and give the full definition in the future. So I thought this is worth highlighting um, when it's talking about the uh, category of sets being a monoidal category. From here, we'll move on to the second subsection very briefly, which just talks about records, which is something that is specific to uh, Haskell and not C++, but I believe there are other functional programming languages that have uh, records as well. And I think non-programming uh, functional programming languages that also have uh, product type language facilities that are called records. So basically what this is, is this is the example taken from the textbook that's just um, giving an alternative to using a tuple where you have unnamed um, elements or arguments of your product type. So this is basically two strings and an integer, which is representing a, a element from the periodic table of elements. So we've got the name, the symbol, and the atomic number. Uh, but here, when you have a tuple, um, there's no nice way to extract this information. You basically have to use like first, second, uh, third, or you have to use like an at uh, exclamation mark syntax in order to reach into this product type and get out the information. Whereas if you use a record, you can name these uh, elements and then have a nicer facility for extracting these. So this is familiar to us in a language like C++ or Python. When you create a class, um, you are naming all your um, elements of that class. From here, we'll move on to the third subsection, some types. So this is the duality or the dual of um, product types. Um, so it says, just as the product in the category of sets gives rise to product types, the coproduct gives rise to some types. The canonical implementation of a some type in Haskell is the following. So here we have an either and then two constructors left and right. So we've been seeing either in the last couple of chapters, and this is how you define it. It's a super minimal syntax. It's one of the reasons I love Haskell. Um, you don't, there's real, no, no real noise around this and it's generic. So it's basically saying that we've got two generic types, A and B that correspond to left and right. And uh, the chapter later goes on to say, similar to what we saw before in the first subsection, it turns out that set is also a symmetric monoidal category with respect to co-product. Co the role of the binary operation is played by the disjoint sum and the role of the unit element is played by the initial object. So awesome to have this pointed out as well. And we're going to see more about this in the final sub section on the algebra of types. The subsection later goes on to talk about an example of a sum type where the text reads simple sum types that encode the presence or absence of a value are variously implemented in C++, C++ using special tricks and impossible quote unquote values like empty strings, negative numbers, null pointers, etc. 
This kind of optionality, if deliberate, is expressed in Haskell using the maybe type, which is defined very similarly to either, except instead of having left A, right B, we have nothing pipe, just A. So nothing represents uh, when you don't have a value, and then just is representing when you do have a value of the generic type A. And this is actually known as a number of different things in other programming languages, which you might have seen by the thumbnail of this video. So in Scala, Rust, OCaml, and F Sharp, they use it's called an option, and then the two sort of constructors or the equivalent of the constructors in Haskell are called sum and none. In Haskell, uh, PureScript and Elm, uh, they use maybe as the name of your optional type, and then just and nothing as the two constructors. And this makes a lot of sense for these first two categories because PureScript and Elm are extremely influenced by Haskell. PureScript is basically just a JavaScript, a JavaScript version of Haskell. And Elm is basically a Haskell light targeting sort of front end web development. And for the first category, uh, Scala, OCaml, and F Sharp are all ML derivatives. And you could argue that Rust is an ML derivative as well. Although if you make that argument, you're going to get a ton of people saying, telling you that Rust is not a functional language, but it does have a lot of support for functional features. And those come from uh, a lot of the ML uh, family language, language family. And then last but not least, we have C++, which in C++17 got the optional type. It doesn't really have constructors. It just has a value method to extract the value if it is there and null opt when uh, that's the equivalent of your nothing and none. And then Swift also has an optional type, but it's called an optional, but borrows the sum and none uh, terminology from the ML uh, language family. Moving on to the final subsection, we have 6.4 algebra of types where the text reads taken separately, product and some types can be used to define a variety of useful data structures, but the real strength comes from combining the two. Once again, we are invoking the power of composition. And then the textbook goes on to show a bunch of examples how by combining these two, you can build up more complex data structures such as lists, uh, but we're not going to go into that. I highly encourage you to read the full chapter or watch Bartosz Maluski's uh, corresponding lecture, um, which cover this. The part that I wanted to highlight from this subsection was the following. It's these two tables that show the relationship between natural numbers and types and logic and types. And I'm not going to go into this into detail, uh, but I think it is super interesting to sort of look at this and uh, ponder about it. The logic and types one, I think, makes a lot of sense uh, with false and true respectively mapping to void and the unit type. And then uh, the logical or and logical and um, mapping to sort of an either some type or a uh, product type that is a pair of A and B. And the similar sort of comparisons are made in the natural numbers to types. Uh, but on top of this, the textbook or Bartage states, this analogy goes deeper and is the basis of the Curry-Howard isomorphism. This is specifically after the logic and types table between logic and type theory. We'll come back to it when we talk about function types. So super interested to revisit this. I have definitely heard about the Curry-Howard isomorphism, you know, more times than I can count on podcasts, sometimes as jokes, sometimes because people are actually, uh, you know, delving into the topic. But um, yeah, definitely looking forward to re re revisiting this in a future chapter. And with that, we'll hop into the exercises of which we're going to cover, I believe, uh, three out of the five, technically three and a half. So the first one asks, number one, show the is isomorphism between maybe A and either unit A. So all we need to do to show that uh, these two are isomorphic is to basically uh, implement two conversion functions to show that there's uh, no information lost. So here is that implementation. We're using Haskell because either and maybe are from the Haskell language, although you could have re-implemented these and then shown the isomorphism in your language of choice. But here we have maybe to either, and then below that we have uh, either to maybe. So basically when you have a maybe, we're gonna pattern match on the two cases where we have a just or we have a nothing. In the nothing, we map to a left with the unit and just we, we map to a right with the value X, which is pattern matched here. And then vice versa, we're just doing the same thing for either we're gonna pattern match on left and right and then map the unit to nothing and X to just X. And if we test this uh, with the numbers 42 and 70, 17, 29, you're gonna see um, the corresponding mappings uh, that are shown above in these two functions. So. Uh, this is sounds like a complicated question, you know, proving isomorphism um, or showing isomorphism, but really it, it's quite straightforward. Moving on to, to question number two, uh, three and four sort of all combined into one. This is an abbreviated version of the question, but it says implement shape in C++ or Java as an interface and create two classes, circle and rect, uh, which are for circle and rectangle, implement area as a virtual function. So 
I'm not going to do this in C++ or Java because coincidentally, I give a talk back in November of 2020 where I actually solved this question in five different languages uh, by total coincidence. So C++, Haskell, Rust, Swift, and D. I will leave a link in the description to both the GitHub repo that has the code for all of those five solutions and the talk if you're interested in checking it out. I'm going to highlight the Swift solution, which is it's slightly different than what the question asks, but you know, 80% the same. So. This is using a protocol which can be sort of thought of as an interface in Java. They're not equivalent, but that's what the talk that I gave sort of talks about is some of the differences uh, between the facilities for uh, you know, bounded parametric polymorphism. But uh, I'm not gonna get into that here. Basically, we define this protocol that implements, uh, has three functions you need to implement, name, area, and perimeter. And for uh, rectangle and circle, you can see this is very similar to sort of the interface syntax of Java and C++. Um, or inheritance in C++, I should say. And C++20 is actually getting a uh, language facility called C++20 Concepts. Not going to go into that there. You can do the same thing using Concepts, which is what I showed in my talk. But here, you're basically just implementing each of the functions. And if you are using a protocol to define a class and you don't implement one of these functions, you're going to get an error. So question three asks you to implement circumference for circle that's not included in the sort of protocol, quote unquote. Uh, so here, if we wanted, we could just delete the three perimeters and then re or rename perimeter for circle to circumference and then just delete perimeter here and in the protocol and then this would work. And then question number four asks you to extend this example to include square. So here you just basically do the exact same thing we've done for circle and rectangle, except we are redefining uh, the three functions. So name is going to return square, area is just going to be uh, the width squared or the length of the side squared, and the perimeter is just going to be four times the width. And that brings us to the end of everything I want to say about chapter six, other than the fact that you should once again go and check out Bartosz Maluski's lecture. They're always fantastic and are definitely an awesome supplementary resource to both uh, my summary of the chapter and the chapter from the textbook itself. So once again, as always, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. And I hope to see you in the next video where we're going to be covering Functors chapter seven, which I'm super excited about. Have a great day.